we are going to base our discussion on the Pasha of the week. And it's always mentioned that this is actually based on Sikhs from them. Um, and then ultimately talk about ourselves a little bit, which is the most important part. Um, the Pasha this week, you know, is Pasha's Akev. The word Akev, you learn in Rashi, that Akev means the hill. The hill is the lowest part in the human body. And it's not just because it's low on the ground. It's the least sensitive of every, of all the parts in the body. Like if you put the heel in, the, in hot water, it will hardly be sensitive in comparison to every other part. In other words, just by the very name of the Pasha, we already know that this Pasha speaks about Eden at the level in the state of reduced sensitivity, like the ache. And as we see in the Pasha, the Pasha begins by the Royo Ekev Tishmu'un. Tishmu'un means you will hear. And we know that there are two senses, two primary, most important senses of the person. The person that is sight and hearing. Sight is the finest and most sensitive of all the senses that a person has. This we mentioned many times, we discussed it from many angles. In sight, you are aware of reality without, without coming in contact with it. Like you're aware of this cup without ever touching it. Does anybody know how to hand operate this guy? No, no, I'm famous now. That should be air conditioning. Yesterday, so who, who did it yesterday? I did, I did that yesterday, that's what I did. No. I put it on fan, like, but it's still blue cooler, like, uh, No, no, fan is not blowing cool air, fan is fan. Alright, okay. so you have it on fan? I turn it off. Turn it off. Okay, we'll see. Okay, we have this one. Okay. Okay, fine. I've said yesterday we had cool air. I don't know what. Alright, forget it. Let's just get back into it. So, as we've discussed many times, it's important that we appreciate and understand what, what Hashem has given us, what the human being is. Uh, we have sight and we have hearing. And we have three other senses. We have sight, hearing, touch, smell, and taste. Each one of these senses makes us aware of the world around us. All the other senses except for sight, the way we become aware of the world around us is by coming in contact with it. How do we, how are we aware that I'm touching something when I'm touching? I'm in, 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 in contact with it. The same thing in smell, same thing in taste, and the same thing in hearing. In hearing, the sound actually comes and hits 
the eardrum and it disturbs, so to speak, the ear, and that's how we hear. Whereas in sight, sight does not come in any disturbing manner. It doesn't, it doesn't come kind of, and it, uh, and it, it jerks us into seeing. It's called totally passive. We see the reality without ever coming in contact with it, without it affecting us in any way. And that way, as we always mentioned, that in sight also, what we see about the, the world is a totally different level than what we, we, what we realize by touch or anything else. Everything else and by touch, we only, we only realize the effect that this object has on me. It's not the real object as it is unto the truth of it. Whereas sight recognizes the very truth of the object itself. And the, the simple illustration of that, which we all experience all the time, that if you hear somebody speak, somebody's sound, some voice, and say, oh, this sounds like his voice. How does it sound his voice? Well, he's got a little squeak and he's got a little, a little um, accent. He's got this high pitch, low pitch. You have some kind of a, of a sign, some kind of an indicator that this correlates this sound to his voice. You're not 100% sure. It's not because you see this is his voice. You have some indicators, something that correlates it. Whereas when you see a person, you see a person, you don't say he, the, that I have signs that this is him because he has got this kind of eyebrows, he's got this kind of nose, this kind of mouth. <laughs> it doesn't go that way. You say this is him, not this is these are his signs. This is him. Because sight is such a fine sense, such a fine um, element that we can actually see the reality itself. You can understand that we have correspondingly, correspondingly, you understand what that means? Similarly, just as we have a physical sight, physical hearing, we have also spiritual sight and spiritual hearing. But just as in a physical sight and hearing we see this difference between sight and hearing, the same thing spiritually. We have uh, we have seichel. This is generally speaking what we see as as the truth and reality. And the sensitivity of seichel, the reality, the truth that we see in seichel, is much much superior than that which we feel in the heart. And even within the seichel itself, you may have learned. In Seichel itself, there are different levels. There is Chokhmah and Bina, and that which we are sensitive to in Chokhmah is much superior, much more related to the truth than that which we see in Bina. In Bina, we already have to convince ourselves and explain to ourselves and prove to ourselves that this is so. Whereas in Chokhmah, we don't have to. That we realize the reality of the itself by seeing the thing itself. It's called seeing. So we have seeing and hearing. The Ruchni is, even as we have seeing and hearing, the Gashmi is. And the difference between them is similar. In order to be able to see, you have to be on a much higher spiritual level in, stand, in contrast to hearing. Right. And uh, like Bina. That's within Seichel itself. To be more correct, Seichel in general is called the ear, sight. Within that, we have two levels. Chokhmah and Bina. Bina is closer to hearing. Chokhmah is being closer to seeing. And then we have the Mida, is the emotions, which are completely personal experiences, which is like touch, like, like smell. So it's a real personal experience. All right. Ah. 
So therefore, this Pashas Akev speaks to the Yidin at the level where they, where they do not have this element of seeing Ruchnis, of seeing Godliness. Tishmiyun, they only have the element of Tishmiyun. They can learn and understand. And they act on the basis of that, of that realization. In contrast, uh, let me just go one more step. When you are at the level of Tishnu, not only what you understand, but you have to work through your own intellect and, and convince yourself and prove to yourself and guide yourself, then your entire avoid or all your entire path in life is based on your personal struggle. You have to work through every step to give you an illustration from experience if you walk into this room and it is pitch dark pitch dark means completely dark and you want to you want to make your way around the room without stumbling without falling without getting hurt what do you have to do you have to feel your way around. You walk around the walls, feel your way around, then slowly you go into the middle, you feel, and you get to identify, oh, here's a chair, here's a table, here's a this, here's that, and you kind of reconstruct the, the setup of the room in your mind from, from understanding, from getting to know what's going on. So through this effort of getting, of figure, finding out piece by piece, you get a picture of what the room is. But even then, you have to constantly be careful. But you know where to be careful. You know, here there may be something else that take, take it easy here. Too. But when you come into the room and it's bright light, you don't stand, you don't stand in any danger. You, you go straight to where you want to go. It's inviting. Not only do you know where everything is, but you know what it's all about. It's a completely different experience. The Ruchnius, we have these similar levels, these similar elements. When a person is in a state of, on, on the higher sensitive state of, of the ego, where he recognizes and sees the truth of the world, he sees the godly truth in the world, then the world does not pose any kind of challenge. It does not confuse him. It does not detract, it does not uh, deviate in his path. It doesn't cause him any deviation. He knows where he wants to go, he knows how to deal with every situation. When the person is in the dark, and the only way he can figure things out is by uh, uh, guiding himself, by figuring out the, the, the actual contours, what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad. And you have to study it and figure out the differences between one situation and another situation. This is muta, this is also. Then it's a completely different, different life. And then on top of it, you have the world is trying to, to entice you to go in a different way. The world says, there is a reality in the world itself. Why are you asking God what you should do? Why don't you ask the world what you should do? And there's a complete, there's a new, there's another master, so to speak, another ruler. And that becomes a struggle. This is like the Alfred ever says, the struggle between Nefesh Olakis and Nefesh Aban. It's a Torah and a Haram. That struggle exists only in the dark. It doesn't exist in light. Tzaddikim, as the Alter said, don't have that struggle. Let's go back a little bit to the previous Pasha, Pasha Zohar's Hanan. Pasha Zohar's Hanan In contrast, right in the beginning, in, in the name of the Pasha, Boaz Hanon, 
Rosh Hashanah, Meish Rabbeinu says, I pleaded with Hashem. And um, the, the word, Boaz Hanon, which means I pleaded, denotes, it speaks about the kind of pleading, not like a normal philo uh, uh, or prayer. The meaning of pleading, Boaz Hanon, is a kind of plea that he's asking that Hashem should grant, it, grant him something by Hashem, because of Hashem's grace and goodness, not because he deserves it. In other words, it's not something that he worked through and deserves. Hashem should, his grace, he should bestow it on. In other words, right in the beginning, we, we see that Pashas Boaz Hanun speaks at a different level. That Hashem is the one who is granting the, the goodness from above. Not something that we have to work through and find on our own. And as, and, 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 and we see right in the wording of the Bible in the beginning of the passage, it was Hanun Hashem. What was the plea? Ebro Nova Ebro. That I'm mentioning, is asking Hashem, allow me to cross the Yadin and see the land. So by the way, we're talking about seeing. See the land. Moshe Rabbein wasn't asking that I should be able to settle in the land and live in the land. I just want to see it. So the Pastor was come and speaks on the level of sight. And the truth is that even though Moshe Rabbeinu did not get his request to cross the Yardin, but he did get satisfaction for seeing the land. You all know that Moshe Rabbeinu saw the land. Hashem told him to go up on the mountain and he showed him the entire land. Now, I want to mention, before we go into this more deeply, there are several things that are mentioned in both Pashas, in Pashas Boaz Hanon and in Pashas Eitri. And there, is, there, there are significant differences in the way it is mentioned in Boaz Hanon, the way it is mentioned in, in, in Eitri. And these differences will give us an, an insight of, of the, these two levels of Avedi. In Pashas for Hanun, you know, we had the Pashas Shema Yisrael. Shema V'yahavta, the first Pashas Krishna. In Pashas Seikin, we had the second Pashas Krishna. Lo Yim Shemayim. We didn't get there yet, but you may know it from last year, but you'll get there in a couple of days. Shema V'ho Yim Shemayim is in Pashas for Hanun. Pashas Seikin. Both of these Pashas are Pashas of Father Krishna, and both speak about Ahavas Hashem, the Ahavas Hashem Alekhefer, and Pashas Vahim Shemei, it says, the Ahavas Hashem Alekhefer. In Pashas Shema, it says, you should put on film, in Pashas Vahim Shemei, it talks about film. Pashas Shema, it talks about teaching your children, in Pashas Vahim Shemei, it talks about teaching your children. But then there are differences, and all that will come back to it. Just want to give us a, a kind of an outline how are we going to deal with this? Sorry? Yeah, actually I'm just mentioning generally there are many more differences. Are the differences? No, I'm, I'm right now I'm showing the similarity. I didn't talk about the differences. The differences will show up. Similarity in both of them, it says, the meets with of Ava Sashem, the Havta Sashem Lakeha, and in Pashas Vayim Shemei, it says, Le'ahavas Hashem. Pashas Vayim, Pashas, after in Pashas, the first in Shema, it says, you should teach your children, you should not come live on Lecha. Pashas Vayim Shemei, it says, Le'ahavas Hashem. Pashas Vayim Shemei, in Pashas Shema, it says, Ukshatam Le'ahavas Hashem, Le'ahavas Hashem, Le'ahavas Hashem, Le'ahavas Hashem, Le'ahavas Hashem. And in Pashas Vayim Shemei, it says, Ukshatam Le'ahavas Hashem, Le'ahavas Hashem. Pashas Shema, it says, Ushatam Amazuzi Besecha. Pashas Shema, it says, Ushatam Amazuzi. There are all these similarities. But then there are differences in how, in, in how these things are expressed in these two Pashas. And when we will discuss these differences, we will see um, from the two perspectives and two levels of these two Pashas. I mention this in order that we shouldn't get lost as we go through 
the discussion. In principle, as you mentioned, verse Hanan is speaking about Eden at a much higher level, level of the ego. Um, speaks about Eden on the level of Shmi. There isn't that clear vision. They have to, everything has to be processed through the Seher to understand and to know. And then it's a struggle. You have to work, work on your own. You work on your own. <coughs> now, in examining the difference between hearing and seeing, we discussed in terms of the Madriga, but more practically, and there, are, there are very significant differences. Um, seeing, number one, is something that has no, does not imprint itself. Imprint itself does not have, make a mark in the person. You see it, but it doesn't become part of you. You see it while you see it. When you turn away, you don't see it. You don't have that experience with you. you don't have to, but that which you hear, and that which you understood, you can take with you. You can reflect on it. You learned it, you know it. And you can know how to apply it. But that which you so, see, this, the impression of sight, is something which exists only during the time that you are actually seeing. Afterwards, when you turn away from seeing it, you don't have that experience anymore. Which means that it's a very significant and very deep experience, but it does not permeate, does not penetrate, doesn't become part of you. You can retain it. When you remember the picture in your mind, is, it, you remember it in a form of hearing. Now, when you remember the picture that you can describe, not the experience itself, that you don't have. This is another phenomenon that in sight, that what you have seen, you can describe to somebody, but you can never get him to experience that which you experience when seeing it. Absolutely no way. And it's an interesting phenomenon goes along with this, that if you hear about something, you have a perfect description of a certain phenomenon. Perfect. And then you're anxious to go and see it. Why? You have the description of it. And you know what happens when you see it? That's when you're awed first. That's when you're first taken. Wow. What's why? You already knew what to see, what to expect. What? That's what seeing is a totally different impression. That cannot be transmitted with words. That cannot be remembered in, in the, the impression itself. That's a different thing. That's something which is unique to the, to the connection. That's what sight connects it directly to the real essence. Okay. It's an interesting, uh, along with that, we have a similar to that is that you can transmit to someone else what you heard. You go out to Shia and you want to say, oh, what, what was the Shia about? Oh, here's what you learned. But you cannot transmit to someone else what you saw. Again, you can tell them only that which can be described in words, but not the experience itself. There's no, there's, it's not a tangible thing. Sight is not a tangible thing. And this is why it is possible to see something and to have, to have the experience of sight. And then when that sight ends, you in short order, you lose the whole impression of it, and you go right back to where you were before. This is the amazing thing that happened to us 
in the midbar. We saw all the miracles. Forget about the miracles. We saw Hashem. We heard Hashem speak to us at, um, at, at the Hasina. And we saw the fire. We saw all of that thing. And before Moshe had a chance to come back with the Luchas from the, from the mountain, we already made a car, a golden car. Went right back to where we, to where we were. Because, because there was nothing to retain with you. It doesn't retain. There's another element in sight. That's a very interesting phenomenon that when many people sit together and learn together, they hear a lecture, they hear a shia, like we're discussing things. They're all, in fact, hearing it together. And they can actually discuss it. And they feel that I'm not seeing it alone. There are other people who are hearing the same thing, and we're contemplating it together. Because hearing is something which, which can be shared. You can share the thoughts that you hear. How did you understand this? How did you understand this? Where a sight, when people experience sight, they can see the same thing at the same time, but in fact, they each see individually. It's not a shared experience. It's, it's everyone is independent, individually independent. By himself. Now we are going to go into the two Pashias, Shema Vahoyim Shemaya, and identify some of the differences. And we will be able to understand why those differences. The first thing. The first Pasha Shema begins with Ahavtas Hashem Alekecha B'chol Avavcha B'chol Nafshcha B'chol Meyoidecha The second Pasha Bo Yim Shemeya starts Le'ahavas Hashem Alekecha B'chol Avavcha B'chol Nafshcha Here we have two differences In the first Pasha it says B'chol Avavcha B'chol Nafshcha B'chol Meyoidecha There's a third level that's mentioned in the first Pasha and it's not mentioned in the second in the second Pasha it says, Another difference is, and the first Pasha it says, In singular form. Whereas the second Pasha, He speaks in plural. And Rashi, you'll see what Rashi Rashi says, that the first Pasha speaks like it to each individual. And the whole Nafshech and the second Pasha to speak to Atzibur, all eaten together. All eaten together. On the basis of what we already discussed, we can see and, explore, and understand the, the, the basis and the reason for all for these differences. The first Pasha is speaking about even at the level when they are at the level of sight. They see God in this. And when you see godliness, it's not a shared experience. Each one has it on his own. It's just a sign. And this is why the Pasha expresses everything in singular form. The second Pasha speaks about the level of Eden and Eden on the level of Shmiya, of only understanding and hearing. And, and hearing is a shared experience. And this is why it speaks as Bechol of Abchem, Bechol Nafshechem. We're all together. The first Pasha speaks about even at the high level of the Eel, of sight. And that's why it says there's a third level of Ahava. Third level of Ahava is Bechol of Abchem, Bechol Nafshechem, with all your heart, with all your soul. And then there is also Bechol Mo'idechem. The third level, which we will be briefly discussed. The third, second Pasha is not mentioned in the Because in order to reach that level, 
you have to have this higher, this higher experience of the ego. Shmiya will not bring you to that level. Briefly, the the whole Mo'itcho, many of you may, may have already learned about it, the whole Mo'itcho, means the whole of Ocho, the whole of Ocho. Let me step back a little bit and give you a little background to, under, to be able to understand this. We all know, it's a little deviation, but these are all valuable things to us to understand. We all know that we have a soul. We have a soul. And we all understand that the neshama really is much higher than, than the body, much higher than anything that we experience. But the neshama, we can recognize elements of the neshama in our bodies through the, the effects that the neshama has on our body. The neshama, after all, connects with the body and gives us life, it brings the body to life. And we have what's called the koiches and nefesh, the, the koiches, the, the functioning elements of the nefesh, like chokma, bina, like we said, seichel and nefesh. These are things which we can feel and experience here. So these are the means by which the neshama can relate to the body, and the body can relate to the neshama. Not at the highest level of the neshama, seichel of the neshama, but nevertheless, there's some element of seichel that we can understand even in our bodies. Some element of the midas, of the ahava and yira, that we can also experience in our bodies. But this is only what's called the koiches and nefesh. Koiches means the functioning capabilities of the nefesh. The expressions, the messages. And then there is that which is higher, which is called the essence of the nefesh itself. The, 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 the soul itself, the truth of the nefesh itself, that cannot be contained in the body. That remains, that is above it. And that cannot be attained, attained, cannot be reached through our seichel, because this is higher than seichel. We cannot understand it. We cannot reach, to, reach it through our seichel. Wow. But the, 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 the essence of the Neshama itself cannot be recognized and realized through the self. We cannot attain it to our self. There is nevertheless a means by which we can relate to that higher element. Not through our effort, not through our understanding of our self, but if it is shown to us, like when Eden were in, in Esosron, they were in the Bezamigdosh, and they saw in the Bezamigdosh, they saw, literally, they saw garlands. What did they see? In addition to the miracles, in the Bezamigdosh, it says there were ten ongoing miracles, constant miracles. But these are all, miracles are only, so to speak, yeah, it's all wonders, but it's only signs, it only is indicative that there is something greater over here. But the, the seeing the greatness itself, that's a separate thing. In the Vesla Midrash, Eden had an experience of seeing the truth of Godliness directly. So through sight, one can actually experience and see that higher element of the Neshama that cannot come through the Kurtis, through the functioning Kurtis, through the Seichon and Nikos. Since that this first Pasha speaks to Yin, when they are at the level of sight, it mentions also the Chol Mo'oidcho. Chol Mo'oidcho, in fact, is inferring to that level of Ahava that is known only to the Neshama itself not to the neshama as it functions through the, in the body, but the neshama in its purity as it is independent of the body. The 
we all know that we all possess we all possess the ability what's called Mesiras Nefesh this is a, 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 a really a shocking thing Mesiras Nefesh Ayid gives his life up for godliness he has never seen God what is he giving his life for? What is it to gain? What, what, is, what does it mean? He's giving his life for us. There is no rationale for it. Rationally, there's no way that one can come to this mother. What then enables him and has what kind of what kind of of, of sense is this, what kind of capability is this? This is the sense of the pure Nishom. Nothing to do with our physical existence or physical life. And we are, have the capability of relating to that through this higher element which is sight, which is pure and, and sees the truth itself, not through any logical and rational proofs. Sight in a literal sense? Sight in the spiritual sense. Seeing the truth. This is also called, you can see this, the level of Chaya. You know that the Nishama has five names. Nefesh Ruach Nishama. Nefesh Ruach Nishama refers to Nefesh refers to the more tangible, the, the physical elements, the, the, the senses, the touch, the actions. Mashoma Dibor Maisa. Ruach refers to the leaders, the emotion. And Mashoma refers to the Seichel that's in the, in the brain. Above that, above the brain, above the Seichel, there is Chaya and Yechida, which remain always above its number, not become part of the group. And this is also something which is granted to us, it's there. And we come in touch with them when we rise to a higher level, uh, uh, what's called a level of, when it's shown to us in the form of sight. This is why in the first Pasha, the Ahava, the Alayid, has to Hashem is described in these three levels. Chol Levovcha means with all your heart. As I just said, Bechol, with all your heart means the Yitzhah Teva and the Yitzhah Hora. That the Yitzhah Hora itself, because I live in such, is in such glorified state of seeing the godliness, the Yitzhah Hora itself also wants godliness, like the Alter Rebbe explains in time. Bechol Nafshecha, he is ready to give everything up for, for Avira Sashem. Bechol Meyoidecha, this is where he is completely united with the Yitzhah in the second dash, and this is all said in singular form. The second passion, which speaks about Shmiya, as we said, we are not at that glorious level. We don't have that clarity, that sensitivity. We are more drawn, more contained in the world. We see things on the moral level. And the only way for us to know about godliness is to use our seichel and our conviction, conviction about seichel, rational, rational. Therefore, there there is also ahava, but it's only bechol levavcha, bechol lavshcha. You can work on your on your bechol levavcha, bechol lavshcha. You can work on your heart, you can work on your on your desires and so forth. But that's it. The bechol moitcha is not attainable through that process. And this is why also over there it speaks in plural terms. Lavab chem of chol nafshechem. Because that, and I said before, this is a shared experience. Talks to the tzibur. And, and then every individual person it speaks about the person not just as he is higher than the world and, and completely focused on one truth but there are many aspects by him there, many koiches, many desires, many interests and he, he 
coordinates them. He, he, connects, he connects them together. That's what that's Sibu, connecting all the Koyfus together. Sibur. Right? Getting together. In the secret that I'm referring to over here, the rabbi goes on and explains, it's a, it's a marvelous thing because it explains so many different nuanced differences in these two passions. Just briefly, because I want to get back, as I said, to talking about us. Briefly, um, in both passages, as we mentioned before, it mentions about teaching your children further. In the first passage, it says, Vishinantam Livon Lechem. In the second passage, it says, Vilimadetem Oisem Azbunechem. Vishinantam Vilimadetem. Vishinantam. Do you remember the class she says Vishinantum? Vishinantum. The Vishinantum means your students. And what does Vishinantum mean? That you have to teach him that he should have a sharp and clear knowledge. Not just give him information. But you have to, what's called, imbue into him this knowledge. Shinun. Shinun means also sharpness. It should be a sharp knowledge. And Levonecho, the Gibbara says, Levonecho, Elo HaTalmidi. This refers to the Talmud. Now, when do you have Talmidi? Talmidim, Talmidim are very grown people. They're not beginners, they're not children. They are grown people who are already prepared to learn and to, and to work hard on, on this learning. And what makes them come to learn, what makes them to want to learn, what makes all of us to come to learn, because we recognize something more important, something greater, we want to learn about. It. This Pasha speaks about even at a higher level, and that's why it's what we should to that you learn, and that you learn deeply into, into what you're learning, and to know it sharply and clearly. The second Pasha speaks about a different level, and even on a different level. And uh, it says, You should teach them to your children, and there the Benechem means your children in a literal sense. And it speaks about small children. The mother learns out from the Daber Bom that, that when you teach children, a child, a small child, to speak, which is the very beginning time of his development, you teach him to speak so that the first words that he learns to say is as soon as a child knows to speak the first thing that the father teaches his child when he's first and he's still learning how to pronounce words is so we're talking about about children. We're talking about even on a, on a, on a fundamental and developmental uh, uh, level. Another important element in this pasha that is not mentioned in the previous pasha. In this pasha, in pasha's eighty, in Vohoyim Shomeya Tishmiel, it speaks about what will happen if you do not follow Tehro Mitzvahs. Misham Rolochem Penifta Levav from the Sartem Bavayetem Limachedim Mishtach Abisama. What will happen if you do not follow Tehro Mitzvahs and you stray off the path? V'chorach Hashem Bachem Hashem will become angry, so to speak, and the author is a Shemayim and he will, and he will, he will get consequences, terrible consequences. And then the Santum is Lord Ayela as well. I should reflect on what I'm saying. You remember, this this is the real thing. If you don't, if you stray off the path, there are going to be very bad consequences. 
in the first pasha there's no mention of that possibility of straying of the path. There's no mention of straying of the path, there's no mention of any consequences. Because when you talk about a Yidin who is standing in that level, where he sees godliness, he doesn't need any reason, any encouragement to follow us on spot. It's the only truth there is. <laughs> There's absolutely no, no consideration, no possibility of, of any other form. This is the only truth there is. There's nothing confusing him, nothing enticing him to go any, any, any other way. And he doesn't need the encouragement by warning him, hey, if you stray the path, there's going to be a consequence. Doesn't have to become concerned about consequences. Who, the, who has to be concerned about consequences? You know, how do you begin, how do you bring a child into favor? And you want a child to learn all of this. You tell him, if you learn the olive, I'm going to give you a candy. If you don't learn the olive, I'm not going to give you a candy. That's already a consequence. And if it becomes a little bi bigger, you, you tell him, I'm going to keep you away from recess. You're not going to get recess. In other words, the, 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 the beginning, the primary way uh, uh, to, start off, uh, to start off a child to wake him up to learning and to, and to, and to growing up into responsible life, there has to be that element as well. It's rare that a child has his own enticement to go and learn and doesn't need any kind of extraneous, extraneous, extra um, enticement. Enticement means encouragement. To entice him, to give him something so that he would come to do it. It's rare. There are such things, but it's rare. Normally, a normal child, he wants to, he's interested in other things, and in order to get the attention, you have to do something special on his level. So again, we see the clear this, the distinction between the first passage of the Ahavto, which is part of the passage of Eskanon, which is part of the passage that speaks about Eden at the level of the Iyah, and the um, passage of Eden Shumeya, the of Eikid, which speaks of Eden at the level of, of Shmiya. It's important one to know and to remember that even though the ego we may lose, we are not always sensitive to seeing godliness, but regardless of where we are, we are always able to, to delve into with our seichel and understand and relate to the truth of um, uh, the level of shmiya, the level of seichel. This we are always able to. And this is what the Pasha is saying. The Hoyim Shumeya speaks about Eden when they're on this lower level and when they are in Golis, because you'll lose your land. That's what the ultimate consequence is. You'll lose your land and you'll go into the nations. You'll become going to Golis. But even in Golis, you will still retain that capability. You will still retain the capability of teaching your children fairy civil animation. You still retain the capability of putting on film and keeping mitzvahs and putting on the mezuzahs and on the doorpost and all the other things. In mitzvahs, when you learn this pasha in the Chumash, Rashi says that this repetition again, when he says in the Torah, Okshat, and again in the second passage, you put on film and, and, and we teach your children and put on film and and um, and mezuzahs, it is to tell you that even when you are in Golos, you should continue to do these things. The real in your mitzvahs is when Eden and Israel and have a And you see godliness. But even when that is concealed and you don't have that that experience, that realization. Nevertheless, we are still capable of doing mitzvahs and still capable of learning to and keeping on the path, staying on the path and, and teach our children and raise our children to take the mitzvahs. So 
So there are many other um, aspects in this, but um, this brings us to the point which I wanted to discuss on our, on our personal element. <coughs> As I mentioned before, um, we are all in Golis. That we all know. We are in Golis, right? The Rebbe always would say there's a Golis Akloli and Golis Aprot. Golis Akloli means the Golis of the Jewish nation in general. The fact that we are not in Etzes Royal, we don't have a Zamnigdash and so forth. And then there is Golis Aprot. Every individual person has his own Golis. Where he does not related to the Gabi truth and then he has a struggle with his own with own with his own confusion and he has a struggle and convince himself and fight fight with himself, not just with the outside world. He has, to, he has an internal struggle. So I want to mention several things that we have to realize. The first thing is the, 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 the element of this in the Baal Tshuva. And you know, again, I always mention, we're all Baal Tshuva. Because in the Golas, we're all Baal Tshuva. We're constantly all struggling. We all have to constantly struggle with our, with our confusion with the world, with our own um, view of life and view of the world. And here comes this great significance of the fact that this is on the level of hearing rather than on the level of seeing. When a person comes from an experience of sight, of seeing something, which we said before that seeing is something which is very individual. It's not something that can be shared. So when he comes away from that experience, from that sight, he still feels alone. And he comes back, so to speak, into his society, into the world. He, he can relate. There's no interrelationship between what his experience is and what other people's experience. He still feels alone. So he's going to make a decision on the basis of what he's seeing and start, so to speak, a new path in life, he's going to be feeling completely isolated and he has to base it entirely on his own experience. Whereas, when you're talking about um, Shmiya, Shmiya is something which people can share. And as I said, this is in, that Sibur is entire Jewish people. One of the most important elements that every year has to realize and about Shuva has to contemplate on it very deeply. And that is that even though we have a very limited amount of actual knowledge of Yiddishkeit, we did not start from the cradle, we did not start from, from childhood on, we missed out um, on the whole process of growing up with Torah Tzibol on the Moshe. Something that we just learned afterwards and we, we understand it, we, we recognize its truth and we believe in it, but it's something which, how do we truly relate to it on a personal level? It's something which, which is so strange to us, it's foreign, it's a foreign language. So we have to understand that the primary India, the primary principle that relates us to Torah Mitzvah is the fact that we are part of the Tzibur. That every Yid is part of the Jewish people. Before he even starts, before he even starts, like we start teaching our children, the child doesn't know anything. Why are you teaching a child Torah to the Lord Mitzvah? In the world, 
listen to this. In the world, there is a, so to speak, a kind of a, of a, of a, um, um, uh, argument or a, a gainsay. You say, why are you teaching yourself? Let him grow up and make his own choice. How do you know he wants, he wants to learn this? Let him grow up and let him make his own choice. This is what some people actually, <laughs> I mean, used to now, but Hashem is, uh, it has been uh, to a great extent broken through. I'm sorry, I'm But uh, there is such a thought. Not of every person made his own intellectual, intelligent, adult decision. On what basis are we teaching our children? On the basis that they are Jewish children. <coughs> and because they are Jewish children, we know what they want to learn. This is not being superimposed on them. This is their real desire. This true principle is true about every Eid and every Baltru. So that when we begin to learn at an advanced age, start learning all of at the, so to speak, an advanced age, an adult stage, an adult age. So we say, oh, I'm just a beginner, I'm starting from, from, from nothing. No one starts from nothing. No one starts from nothing. The starting point is that this Torah is, belongs to every Yid. That's why the person says, This is not individual. This is our mutual and, and communal heart. And every Yid belongs to that communal heart. Whether he knows what that means, what he doesn't know. And this is why you can come to Ayid, as I always wonder, you can come to Ayid in the middle of Manhattan, in the middle of Times Square, and the whole world is running back and forth and, in, and, and concerned about whatever it is, the less sales and the less um, Wall Street and whatever, the whole, all kinds of different things. And you stop in the middle and he's running and says, please, are you Jewish? Yes, what do you want? Put on film. Oh, what's that? Don't worry about it. It's, it's a Jewish thing to do. Oh, yeah, Jewish thing. I'll take it. I'm sorry? That was very easy. It's almost that easy. Sometimes that, sometimes that works. It's almost that easy. Yeah. You know, there was, a, there was, a, there was this, this um, episode that actually happened. Um, a couple of, you know, the, the Mendel Futopas, you heard the Mendel Futopas. He was on a plane. On, on, on a bus, sorry. <laughs> it's me too, Either on a bus or on a plane, I don't know. And, and there were young people in Lohrim that were trying to go around from to the passengers to get them to put on fear. And there was one particular passenger that refused. The man who us walks up to him and says, and he didn't know English, he didn't come, he couldn't, and always must have been on the plane. He didn't know, he didn't know anything. So he says, I Jew, you Jew. I feel, you feel. He says, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> but in other words, no one starts from a deficit. No one starts from scratch, from nothing. This is what the third says. I love Hashem not because somehow I, as an individual, was I, as part of the Jewish people, love Hashem. And I have it because it makes sense to me. I understand it. I can I learn and I can fight it through. I don't see God in this, but I, 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 I know it's true. I can learn about it. And this is, this is where we start. This is the important thing. 
in our goals, in, in the state of struggle, we have a tremendous advantage. Because <coughs> to see godliness in the Bizarre this was a unique thing. This was for the individuals. But this which we have in the goals, which we were able to uh, carry through in the goals, <coughs> the Shmiya, just about that which hits our eardrums, and we can hear it, and, and we can make sense, and we can relate to it because we are Jews, this stays with us um, unobstructed, without interference. And this is where we start from. And if somebody says, how do you come to Yiddishkeit? You, you don't have it in your tradition, in your family tradition. That is a total lie. That is a total lie. Yiddishkeit and Torah and Mitzvahs belong directly to every Jew. If somebody comes and he claims an inheritance, a piece of property, this property belonged to my parents, and I'm the heir. So do you ask him, were you ever here? Did you ever live in this property? Did you ever experience? It has nothing to do with it. I don't care who lived in this property. This is my property. This is, this is the vantage point from which we come. This is vantage point from which we come, and this grants us the, 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 the open approach to, to, to Yiddishkeit. This gives us a sense of belonging, a comfort. We're not in a strange land. Yes, we have to learn, and we have to ask. Absolutely, we don't assume that we know before we, we, we know. We have to ask. But the fact that we don't know does not change the fact that it's ours. This heir who comes from a strange land and he doesn't, he's never seen his father's property, he needs the, the caretaker to take him around. No, where is the door, where is the house, where is the bedroom, where is the bathroom? You know, he doesn't begin to know. But when he sees it, he knows it belongs to him, it's mine. And this caretaker is only a caretaker. Well, actually, it's mine. This realization, this interconnection, this unity, union, that are all Eden, are one Sibur. And they understand, when they understand things, it's mutual understanding. It's not like in every individual experience is on his own. What I see, you don't see. It's mutual understanding. It's a mutual thinking process. What? Mm -hmm. What's the mutual thinking? Yeah, no, because you weren't here. Shmir, knowing about God, knowing about learning Torah, and, and recognizing God through our Shmir, through our learning, through our Seichel, it's a mutual experience. So with us and other sorry? Jews, with us and other Jews, or with, yeah, with all other Jews. Uh, it's a mutual experience because it belongs to all of us, and thus, this is what puts a smack, so to speak, in the middle of our property. No one should ever feel that he is a stranger. He does not, shouldn't fool himself and say, I know with that which I don't know. That's a very serious mistake that can cause a lot of damage. You have to know, you have to ask, and, and uh, you know, I myself you know, observed here, and I'm doing with Balashuba for 50 years, and, uh, you know, it's amazing. It's, 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 very impressive thing, impressive thing to see an adult person to start learning aloe base. I've seen in, in a home, in a house where they have guests coming in, adult people, business people, and they sit with the little child, and the child tells him about 
this is a knowledge, this is a base, and they sit there and learn from this child. Right? It's very demeaning. Very demeaning. It's not demeaning. Because you're learning about your own property. You're learning about that which is your own inheritance. But you're not going to say, it's my heritage, so I know it. You don't know it. You have to learn about it. But uh, that does not diminish your relationship to it. So when we come to learn something, we tell you, and we have said, oh, I don't understand it. So how do I come to learn it? The answer is, I come to learn it not because I understand it. I come to learn it because it's mine. If it's mine, I want to know everything that's mine. To whatever degree I can know it. With this approach, Ayid comes smack in the middle, so to speak, of the Jewish people as soon as he finds out about it. And he is right there at home. And with this, we carry through all our challenges in the dollars, in the private dollars, and the general dollars, until we reach the dealers. No blessing? No blessing? Oh, sure. Well, I, the blessing we should read is the blessing that we should keep. It's the best blessing that I can say for me, for myself, and for yourselves is remember this principle at all times. Never lose sight of this principle. That way. No matter where you are. That carries us through. The Rebbe once in the Fabrenian said the following. This is many, many years back, like in the late 50s, early 60s. You know, you don't even know that they existed those years, right? But they did exist. Yeah, they existed. I cannot test my I, I saw it. I was there. The Rebbe said, that when it comes to an even a challenge, it says, you know, why am I different than my neighbor? And my neighbor means a Goetian neighbor. We are, we are similar people. Why, why, why do I have a greater responsibility, obligation, and I'm, you know, I'm put, so to speak, um, in a different category, in a different class than my neighbor? He's also a decent person. Lots of difference. So the other says, all you have to do is reflect that when your great-grandfather was walking around the world, teaching the world about God, about the unity of God, his great-grandfather was a cannibal eating raw human flesh. Now you know why you're different. <laughs> It's an amazing thing. I once remember reading an article someplace, and this person, a lady or a man, is writing, is criticizing some kind of a, some, some element in, in, in society. I don't remember exactly what it was. He says, I am the son of cannibals. Cannibals. Really. And I am, and I have grown out of that, and I understand that they should do such and such. So I said to myself, initially, you're the son of cannibals, and you come and teach human beings how to live. <laughs> oh, my, you just have a chance. Hmm? Live it through one generation, two generations. 
Come on. Already you know better than your neighbors. Every one of us, bar none, any ye today that knows that he is a Jew has in his blood ancestry that were Mason Nefesh for each. Those who were not Mason Nefesh for each died. Not far back, I have been lost to Jewish people. This is what's flowing through our blood. This is who we are. This is why I belong here. So we got lost a little bit. We're coming back to claim our heritage. Not very far, not very far back. One, two, most maximum three generations. Everybody remembers what I know you. I mean, you know, what are you talking about? The people who are, who are, you know, completely worldly. Says, oh, my grandfather used to live with us. And he was, he, he wouldn't even eat, from, he wouldn't even drink water in my house. And they're so proud of it. And his picture is prominent in the living room. So they got lost. That means they lose, they lose their property? Right? We have to learn, we have to daven, absorb whatever we can absorb, and know that we are coming home. A lot of us will be feel for one moment as strangers in, 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 a, in a new world. A country, the world you're coming from, that's a strange world. This is the world where you belong. Thank you.